principles of All right, welcome everybody to the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. And today we have a presentation from the Department of Public Works and Services regarding the Tolson Hydro Expansion Opportunity. We have an agenda before us, and given the kind of day we had on the floor of the House, I think we'll start off with a prayer, and I'll ask Mr. McNeely to lead us in the prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for uh, this day. Let us uh, be mindful of decisions that uh, we are making to better serve the people that put us in this office, and also be mindful of the uh, hardships and challenges in our remote communities and the extent of our decisions to help those as well. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Review and adoption of the agenda is noted. We have a presentation from Public Works. Item three on the agenda is declarations of conflicts. Any conflicts on, with any matter on the agenda before us today? Seeing none. Uh, before we get into the briefing, I'll uh, 
go through introductions, and I'll start with uh, my far left, Mr. Bolio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Tom Bolio, MLA for Tunida and Willity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome. Uh, Shane Thompson, Hindi. Good evening, all. Karen Tester, member for Cam Lake. Far right. R.J. Simpson, MLA, Haver for North. Lucy Burt Cabaccio. Danny McNeely, Saudi Region. Good evening. Uh, yeah, welcome. My name is Corey Van Thuyn, MLA for Yellowknife North. And we also have with us from uh, research, uh, Mr. Lee Selleck, and from the clerk's office, Mr. Doug Showerty. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Minister, for introduction of your colleagues and any opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On my right is Mr. Paul Guy, Deputy Minister of Public Works and Services. On my far right is Mr. Andrew Stewart, Director of Energy Solutions Division. On my left is John Vandenberg, Assist Assistant Deputy Minister of Energy Division. And in the gallery here is Mr. Ryan Strain, my Special Advisor. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to thank the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment for inviting us here to today to provide an update on the status of the Tulsa Hydro Expansion Project. The Tulsa Project is identified as a priority in the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change and represents the largest GHG emissions reduction opportunity currently available in the NWT. However, before we can capitalize on this opportunity, we need to establish a long-term market for power and secure federal support. The Tulsa River has provided hydropower to the South Slave region for more than 50 years. It is the NWT's best understood hydro opportunity, and over the last decade we have engaged local communities and Aboriginal governments to find the power potential and capital costs and have incorporated environmental design improvements to minimize effects on fish habitat, wildlife and people. If we move forward, a new 60 megawatt expansion project would be developed next to the existing 18 megawatt plant. This project would take advantage of our existing storage system and re would require no new flooding <coughs> of lands. We know from the past work that it is critical to establish a long-term power market at the front end of this process. The Saskatchewan and Alberta energy system are the closest markets and we are currently learning how to make NWT hydropower attractive to them. We will need to invest in hundreds of kilometers of remote transmission line infrastructure in order to connect the rest of Canada. This element of the project will require us to define the right of way, conduct environmental screening and complete transmission line design. The good news is the Tolson project has the potential to provide a return on equity that can be reinvested across the north. Once completed, this revenue could be directed into renewable energy solutions, including hydro, many hydropower for remote diesel communities, expansion of the NWT hydro grid, grid, as well as renewable heating and transportation solutions that would accelerate our trans transition to a low carbon economy and improve our cost of living over the long term. Saskatchewan and Alberta have made significant commitments to reduce their coal reliance and enhance renewable energy capacity by 2030. We are optimistic that with the help of the federal government, green hydropower from the Tulsa expansion project will be competitive with other renewable generation options. <coughs> this will position the NWT to reduce southern Canada's reliance on coal for power generation while creating linkages that will grow our economy for the next 50 to 100 years. The federal government is looking for interjurisdictional energy infrastructure product projects that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and involve Aboriginal partnerships. Tulsan can be one of those projects. After defining the conditions necessary for a long-term energy market to emerge and securing federal support, we will be able to build a, the business model to realize Tulsan's vast potential. That concludes my remarks, Mr. Chair. With your permission, I would now call on the Deputy Minister of Public Works and Services, Mr. Paul Guy, and his staff to walk us through a brief history of the Tulsa Project, the challenges we face, and the opportunities that lie ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for recognizing the time of day and uh, the committee's schedule. I'll uh, try and keep this as brief as I can. Uh, leave time for questions. So. 
Getting right into it, uh, going to slide two, this is the outline of the presentation. I wanted to talk a little bit about Tolson, Southern Link, the Energy Corridor, make sure there's full understanding of what the project is, background and history status, how we got to where we are today, some of the project benefits, particularly around uh, greenhouse gas emissions or reductions, um, alignment with some of the federal priorities that are, are now in place. Uh, a little bit about the, the two energy markets that we're looking at, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan some of the next steps to move the project forward. Uh, moving to slide three, um, one of the most attractive elements of the Tolson expansion, as Minister uh, Schumann said, is that it can be done relatively quickly with low impact on the local environment. The storage system is already established and we can add new generation right next to the existing plant with no new flooding. So what we're really talking about in phase one of the Tolson and Southern Link Energy Corps is the development of a 60 megawatt project, uh, run a river, uh, and it has developed to the stage where uh, it could be in place and operating as early as five years. There's no new flooding required. It's our most advanced hydro opportunity anywhere in, in a territory. What's really uh, challenging with this uh, project is that it does need a customer. It can help foster sustainable resource development and it can reduce national greenhouse gases to 360,000 tons. And I'll get into that in a little more detail later in the presentation. If you go to slide uh, slide four, there's a bit of history. Uh, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've spent a significant amount of money as a government north of territories developing and advancing this project. Uh, when we originally uh, started developing it, uh, we, uh, we were looking at providing power to the diamond mines. Um, we had developed the project essentially through the environmental assessment process. We got environmental regulatory conditions clearly defined regulatory conditions were accepted and we have actually taken it to the point of uh, permitting uh, the McKenzie Valley Environmental Impact Review Board recommending the approval to the federal minister responsible in August 2010. So at that point, uh, we also became clear to us that we couldn't secure quantity and duration of long-term power contracts with the mines. Uh, and at that point, we decided to, um, to put the project on hold. So there's a significant amount of work done, particularly on the generation side. We had a lot of design work done. We had permitting for the generation, and we were at that time looking at a 700-kilometer transmission line to the diamond mines. What's good news for us today is much of the work that we did, particularly around the permitting environmental assessment, uh, the uh, engineering work around the, the, uh, the, the generation is still relevant today and it's still applicable to moving this project forward. And that's what puts us in a position to, if you like, have a project like this advance in as short as five years because that, much of that like work, background work is still transferable and it's still uh, current today. There's some updating that needs to be done for the environmental assessment work, but generally a lot of that uh, uh, baseline work is still valid. So going to slide five, the Tulsa expansion status update. So when we talk about the 60 megawatt generation, that's really a foundational piece. Uh, um, cost estimating uh, were done back in 2010. We're in the process of updating those now. Uh, we're reviewing the regulatory commitments and those transferable documents I spoke about. Um, what we have done less work on, because we're now looking at a southern intertie, it's a transmission to either Saskatchewan or Alberta. We've got uh, desktop work done, route cost estimates for intertie. We've got the right of way um, being investigated, tower design, costing, the environmental screening needs to be completed. Uh, but we have lots of good information on similar transmission line projects in North Saskatchewan to build on. So a lot of the uh, engineering work that they would use is transferable. The costing information is transferable. So in terms of Class D cost estimates for that portion of the work, I think we're fairly comfortable that we're in the range of uh, something that we can work with for, for planning and modeling purposes to, to advance the project. Um, what's also interesting with the 60 megawatt expansion is that uh, facility with, has the potential to be expanded to a total of 200 megawatts. Uh, a lot of the preliminary work in ground truthing has been done to identify how that could be achieved. So once you have the transmission and inner tie done and a market to sell this power cell, you can over the future years do incremental staged additions to that project to for further capacity, uh, increase your sales, generate more revenues that you can invest elsewhere. So when I go to slide six, those are some of the project benefits that I want to speak about. We can leverage the past investments so that the dam is robust, that facility is developed, we can use that, develop it, 
to the 60 megawatts leverage that investment, generate additional revenues that can be invested elsewhere in the in the economy of the NWT, particularly in areas of energy efficiency. We can take those revenues, uh, invest them in energy efficiency uh, upgrades to existing uh, community energy infrastructure. We can put more renewables in, particularly where they're not necessarily uh, self-supporting in a business model without a subsidy. This money could, in a sense, be used to subsidize wind projects or solar voltaic projects in those diesel communities. So that's some of the thinking. It can also be used to invest in the renewal of the existing hydro infrastructure, uh, the snare system as well, or bluefish system, for example, that do have life cycle issues and need to be uh, to be upgraded. So benefits would, would allow us to also, we have the short-term benefits around construction jobs, the business opportunities, we have energy uh, security around the long-term revenue stream, we have a stabilized electricity cost by gaining access to the rest of Canada. That's one of the big uh, initiatives going on uh, in the national energy stage is grid development, not just east-west, but looking at north-south grids, uh, because there is recognition that Canada's grid system is underdeveloped. Uh, we have a uh, country as a whole with good connections to southern uh, to the southern parts of the continent and to the United States, but there's very little east-west. There's a number of studies going on. There's a Western Canada study going on right now that we're participating in, and we've included uh, connected to the north as part of the Western Intertie uh, study. And here's a little bit later in the presentation of both. Um, also, uh, this is a, it's probably our single best uh, opportunity to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions on, on a national scale. Connecting with the rest of Canada and creating revenue is for us to reinvest in the north. Uh, when I talk about greenhouse gas emission potential, I want to draw your attention to slide size, seven. Uh, and what we're comparing there are really the two proposals we have under the, the pan-Canadian framework for, for green, green go growth. Uh, so we had a... A uh, proposal into the federal government uh, around $140 million of solar diesel efficiency projects in 15 communities um, with a federal ask of $75 million or a 50% subsidy. Those um, would, over the lifetime, reduce 417,000 greenhouse gas tons at a cost ton of about 335. Mr. Chair, I think there's a question. I'm just trying to get into the queue. Oh, sorry. Yep. Further, Mr. Guy? Sir, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so when you compare that to this project, uh, the Tulsa Hydro expansion, uh, the capital cost notionally seven hundred to nine hundred ninety-five thousand, or nine hundred ninety-five million, uh, lifetime greenhouse gas emissions of 18 million tons or 18 megatons for the uh, capital cost per ton of $28 per ton. You can see there's almost a, a six times better uh, return on that type of investment. So uh, when you compare this on a national scale, there are very few projects, I would argue, elsewhere in Canada that give you that kind of uh, return in dollars per greenhouse gas ton uh, for the level of investment. And I think that's one of the things that has piqued the interest of the federal government in this project. Um, it... It, and, then, and you have to also recognize that there's a 50-year life to this type of investment, so that those types of reductions, uh, if you have a market for that power, they're displacing uh, coal or diesel, uh, then it just keeps, give, it keeps returning those investments over the life of the project. Life of the project. Turning to slide eight, there's a number of uh, federal interests. Uh, they are looking at interjurisdictional energy infrastructure. They're looking at things about improving uh, or enhancing Aboriginal partnership opportunities. They are looking for all kinds of opportunities around the country for greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, our Tolston project uh, addresses many of those priorities of the federal government. Uh, we do have an interjurisdictional opportunity with the Southern Intertie. We are looking at Aboriginal partnerships. Um, 18 megatons is a big number for a project like this. I think that's also got their interest. Uh, so we've seen a fair amount of interest to our initial uh, outreach to the federal government, our initial proposal in a number of areas. They've, they've returned back to, to the ministers and the premiers seeking department staff seeking a lot more information about this project. So I think there is interest. In, we hear lots of talk about it at the uh, officials level in her jurisdictional meetings. Uh, looking at our potential energy markets on slide 9 and 10, 
Uh, right now we are focused on the Saskatchewan energy market. There's a lot of uh, benefits to doing that. You're dealing with a crown utility, so we have a crown-to-crown -crown relationship. It's much easier to, uh, to uh, establish partnerships, enter a power purchase agreement. Saskatchewan has 42% coal reliance, uh, one of the larger provinces or jurisdictions in Canada relying on greenhouse gases. They have a target. They've set a target to get to 50% renewable power by 2030. They, they know they need to replace uh, 1,100 megawatts with renewable energy. Um, they are looking at T-Lines expansion, uh, and they have a lot of capacity constraints as well. So, so one of the challenges, although we have a good opportunity there, there's some challenges in the Saskatchewan market, and uh, they have other hydro interests that they're looking at. Uh, in northern Saskatchewan, and if uh, our project went ahead and some of their projects went ahead, then they would probably need to invest in T-line capacity increase as well because they are their T-line system or transmission lines in northern Saskatchewan are not as robust as they are, for example, in Alberta. That being said, we have a very uh, good working, ship, working relationship with Saskatchewan Power. We have an MOU in place at the officials level to explore and expand this opportunity. We have met with them once uh, in the last two or three months. We're meeting with them again next week to advance this project to see, see how we can work together to move forward on it. They have uh, what we believe is genuine interest. I think we are in the right uh, zone in terms of uh, a rate that they would like to pay for this type of power. So. They see it as an opportunity uh, worth pursuing from their perspective. Keeping in mind they have another energy priorities throughout the province as well that they have to balance off uh, how they're investing. But Skyfall Power is fully engaged and we have been working closely. This is building on work that has happened not just this last year but over the last number of years to establish that. Some recent changes in Alberta, you go to slide 10, the Alberta energy market, it's a much more complicated to market to enter. It's unregulated, it's complex, you have to work with the um, Alberta energy um, systems operator. Uh, Alberta's got similar challenges, they're 39% coal, they have a target now as well, they want to add 5,000 megawatts of renewable capacity by 2030. Um, their T-line system is much more robust. Uh, it's much uh, easier to accept the type of power that we would like to sell and the quantities we want to sell it. Challenges, they're a little further away. I think, I think when we talk about um, um, the Saskatchewan T-line connection, we're about 200 kilometers. It's 350 uh, in Alberta to get to the, the connection point in Alberta. Um, but beyond that, they have no real upgrade needs. Their, their system is modern, uh, and, and it would be just a connection. There is an opportunity for Alberta here too. They could connect Fort Chippewa on through this project and, and eliminate another diesel community in their province as well. So we are looking at Alberta. We are, we are considering that as an option, but we're also focusing very much on Saskatchewan. So Mr. Chair, just to conclude before uh, well, I... Uh, take questions, or the minister can take questions. Uh, defining the next, the next steps, uh, we are working on our cost estimating. Uh, we have to have that, uh, the most recent update uh, later this month, if not early next month. Continue to work with SAS Power to defend the market entry costs and the benefits. We are engaging the Alberta um, electricity sector operator to understand the Alberta energy market potential. We're also participating on those regional electricity cooperation strategic infrastructure initiatives to evaluate electricity projects for Saskatchewan and Alberta to reduce coal reliance. Uh, continue to engage our project partners once market provides viable, so the federal government, provincial, Aboriginal partners. Um, certainly we will need federal funding to move this forward, this project. Uh, we, we believe with some federal funding, particularly through the uh, pan-Canadian framework, will um, uh, provide the subsidy we need to support the business case on the project. Uh, and there's uh, certainly um, merit or certainly uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, support that kind of investment when you look at uh, the benefit that this project can provide to Canada's greenhouse gas targets. There is a lot of merit to be, we believe, for the federal government to consider this as, as a reasonable 
uh, return on their investment for, for those types of projects. So we continue to focus on that, uh, engaging with the federal government as well. Mr. Chair, I'll stop there. I know I went rather quickly. I'd be pleased and uh, answer any questions that the committee has. And we have some technical staff here as well, if there's any technical questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Guy. And the presentation is uh, well appreciated. And we'll turn it over to committee for comments, questions, concerns. And first I have Mr. Bolio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm... I'm curious as to what uh, type of uh, uh, discussions um, or engagement has occurred uh, with the Aboriginal uh, governments or Aboriginal people that are using uh, the Tolson River at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Guy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So there's been a number of discussions uh, in the past as we developed the project, got to the permitting stage. Um, the previous uh, iteration of the project when we we're looking at diamond mines. Right now we're focusing on developing the business case, seeing if we can leverage any federal funding to advance the project. Once that's done and we get into the regulatory process, we will then continue to consider those uh, engagements uh, as we have in the past with those users of the, the river system. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Bolio? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm asking about this particular uh, uh, project. Um, I recognize that uh, DAZE, uh, there was consultation that occurred with DAZE at that time when DAZE was being contemplated uh, for the uh, transmission line to the diamond mines. Uh, Aboriginal governments were a partner that were also working with, with, uh, with the GNWT uh, to advance that project. I'm asking about this project. Um, there has been uh, uh, significant impacts on, uh, on the Tulsan River and, the, and impacts of that were felt by uh, uh, the uh, uh, users of Tulsan River going back into the mid-1960s. And I'm, 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 I'm wondering if there, what type of engagement there has been for this particular project at this time prior to trying to get a half a billion dollars from the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I take the members' comments. Uh, uh, when I was with the Mates, I actually participated in some of the DESA stuff. Um, we feel we have to, uh, to work on the pan-Canadian strategy moving forward to build a business case around all this. Uh, and once that's completed, and uh, hopefully we get some re favorable results from the federal government, maybe as early as March 22nd, uh, moving forward, we will be at some point engaging all Aboriginal governments that will be uh, affected by this project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Bolio. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, um, what would be the issue with engaging Aboriginal people now? prior to um, going, if, if the federal government approves um, uh, a half a billion dollars for this, pro this project to move forward, uh, then we, we, uh, we, we start to uh, try to include the Aboriginal people. I, I think that would be a mistake. Uh, it's a way to, it is a way to build opposition uh, from the Aboriginal governments in the area, uh, the communities, the users of the Tulsan River. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge what has happened to date and we need to get them engaged early. This is a huge expansion. This is from 18 uh, uh, kil uh, me megawatts to adding an additional 60 megawatts. It's going to have a, an impact. Whether um, the Power Corp believes that it's going to have an impact or not, we live the impact. We know what happened. We, we were wiped out uh, as trappers of the Tulsan River. Uh, we were wiped out in 1964, 65 in, in, in that time period. So we're very familiar with the impact. So I think it would be beneficial if the government is serious about this project and serious about trying to approach the federal government for funding to engage Aboriginal governments of that area sooner rather than later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Take that as a comment to the comment, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, I take the member's point. As I said uh, previously, I was part of DESE. Uh, DESE involved the KHO, the Mates. Uh, they were well informed of the impacts. This is pretty much the exact same size of the project. Uh, run of the river as DESE was. Uh, 
but we believe that we have to secure some funding moving forward before we engage our Aboriginal governments. And uh, we may, like I said, we may know as soon as March 22nd. If that's the case, we'll be uh, willing to engage with them uh, sooner than later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Bolio? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I don't understand. Um, um, what, what, what is the fear um, of, uh, of uh, engaging Aboriginal governments from that area now versus waiting until the proposal moves forward? Is it a better chance, a federal government more likely to approve it if you don't have Aboriginal involvement? Is that the, this, the case? If that's the case, then I think uh, we're probably looking at the wrong partner because there, there, there would be no issue, in my opinion, with engaging Aboriginal people at the beginning. Like the last time this Tolleson River, the Tolleson River Dam was built, there was no consultation. It was just done. The, the, uh, uh, no consultation to the people that were affected. It was people from, that are now uh, living in Fort Resolution that were moved. The community was, was essentially wiped out. I'm asking the minister again, what would be the issue with engaging Aboriginal governments now? Not, not after we talk to the federal government now. Go together to the federal government, better chance of success. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As we've shown on slide eight, uh, Aboriginal partnership is, uh, lines up with the federal, uh, federal government's interest in this project. Uh, we believe we need to, to move this project forward. We have to have Aboriginal governments and people on side to do this. Uh, all I'm saying is we've taken the approach that we want to secure, lock down the money before we get into these conversations. Uh, we've had it, they've spent years on DESE uh, trying to, uh, to move that project forward and the issue that came about that was they couldn't realize the, the customer at the end of the day and we're trying to uh, mitigate those things moving forward to make this a successful project and we want to have Aboriginal governments and people involved in this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Bolio? Um, uh, if somebody else is on the list, I would go back on. Okay. Not. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And right off the bat, I want to say I am in uh, support of this, this project. Um, I have been for some time, and uh, I'm pleased to see that we are moving forward on it. Um, I just have some questions uh, about federal responsibilities which ministry is or ministry and or minister is responsible for this in the federal government thank you thank you mr. guy um, thank you mr. chair I think there's just uh, engagement with um, a number of ministries uh, ministry of the environment and the pan Canadian framework Environment, climate change, the federal minister, but also the infrastructure minister is involved as well because some of the funding uh, uh, is there. So there's engagement going on with both those departments, and I believe also the premier is engaging at uh, this with the prime minister directly as well. So there's a number of departments involved. Federal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart. Uh, same question, Mr. Chair, but in the Saskatchewan context. Thank you. Thank you. To that, Mr. Guy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in Saskatchewan, we're working with Saskatchewan Power, and uh, I can't quite recall the department's name where it's responsibility for energy, but I could maybe ask Mr. Vandenberg to speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Clarification, Mr. Vandenberg? We brought to the attention of the uh, Department of oh, sorry. Uh, with re respect to this, we've been primarily engaging Saskatchewan Power on a technical basis. Uh, the, the government of Saskatchewan was aware of our, our activities. We did bring it to their attention. However, our, our activities have been directly with, the, with Sask Power uh, to date. Thank you. Further to that, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the Premier has also talked to the Premier of Saskatchewan directly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Um, can we, can the Minister provide any more detail on the uh, government to government discussion around this rather than at the official level? But is there some sort of political, uh, how, far is the, how far apart are we on the political deal making side of this? Uh, if we are, I understand we have the MOU on the officials level, but um, are the Premier seeing eye to eye on this expansion? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, as I said, the Premier's had a conversation with uh, Premier Wall, and uh, he's extremely interested in this project, and I believe that's why we're able to assign an MOU with uh, Sans Power to, to, to explore the expansion and opportunities of this project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Tester? Thank you. Um, and finally, um, I, I see we've done an analysis on the um, – I mean, the things that make this a really viable project for the federal government, the greenhouse gas reductions, um, and uh, uh, the reli increasing the reliability of energy. Um, have we done an analysis, an economic analysis, on any um, cost of living reductions this might, or how this will impact the cost of livings, the cost of living for the average household in the Northwest Territories? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Guy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So that's one of the things that we're working on through the business case. It really depends on what we can sell the power for. Uh, once we have a better cost estimate for the project, uh, we have a, a bit of an understanding of uh, what the, the purchase price would be for the power. Uh, we can also do some modeling around how we would take the excess revenues that we generate and how they could be invested back into the system. Over the long term, I think that's one of the goals here is to use this as a, as a foundational piece, first of all, to get an energy tie connection where we can stabilize the price of power for those connected to this grid. We can take the revenues, excess revenues, use it throughout the system to provide improvements in reliability, lower the costs, lower the costs, the fixed costs of the, the, the power corporation across a much larger rate base because you will have you know, almost uh, another 60 megawatts across uh, of, of those base costs that can be transferred to the sales. So we think there's a number of opportunities and some of the modeling work we're doing on it, looking at that very question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I, thank, I appreciate that, that answer. Um, however, that's, I think, apparent by this proposal that those are all the opportunities of it, but do we have any kind of in the preliminary modeling we've done, do we have an idea of, and I know the department would be hesitant to share that at this point, but I'm curious to know if we have any preliminary sense of uh, the cost savings here that can be shared today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Guy. Mr. Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Obviously, the, the rate that you charge for your power is, is up in the air, and that's part of the discussions with Saskatchewan that are ongoing. But we do know how much power we will produce. So 440 gigawatt hours is expected to come from the system. So if you take that rate and multiply it by 7 cents a kilowatt hour, you're earning in the range of $30 million in revenue to cover your project. If you're selling 15 cents a kilowatt hour, it's more like 65 million. So it really does depend on how much revenue you're producing uh, from this system that can then be reinvested to impact uh, the NWT energy situation. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing further. Next, I have Mr. Simpson. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So the cost estimates are underway. And uh, you also say in there that the capital cost will be $995 million. So I'm guessing that is just for the expansion, and the other estimates are for the, uh, the upgrades to the transmission lines. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Guy. Thank you. So the range that we're using in our engagement with the federal government is the 700 to 995,000. That includes the 60 megawatt expansion plus the 120 kilometer transmission line to uh, connect to Alberta, uh, the Saskatchewan system. Sorry, the 200 kilometer expansion. Uh, what it doesn't include is any further downstream investments to the uh, distribution system that Saskatchewan may choose to make. So they would, again, have to invest beyond that point. So, so basically our, our investment is to do the expansion of phase one and then get it to the market point of connection. Beyond that, there's no other cost. And currently, as, a, as I said before, Mr. Chair, we're just getting uh, our consultants just starting to uh, feed us some of the cost estimating information. And uh, initially, uh, initial read is that we're still in the same range we thought we would be in. So there's been no early surprises, but we're still going through the details. And uh, we'll be able to update the committee uh, at a future time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson? Thank you. And so that's the estimate for Saskatchewan. Has there been cost estimates done to uh, send it to Alberta? Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't think we have gone beyond uh, using the same uh, 1.2, I believe it is, million dollars per kilometer for T-Line, which is consistent with what, what we've seen for a number in Saskatchewan. So we would just extrapolate that to the 350 kilometers, and you can see... Um, you can see uh, what the cost would be. So we haven't gone and developed uh, a connection to Alberta as, as far down that path as we were with Saskatchewan, partly because really Alberta has only recently become uh, something to, to consider. They have uh, uh, had some changes in their philosophy around uh, renewables and, uh, and how they want to uh, advance those things, and that opportunity is much more recent for us than perhaps the schedule was. Uh, initially, we didn't think there was as much opportunity in Alberta as we saw in Saskatchewan. Uh, now, uh, they are opportunities that are worth pursuing and doing the business case on, and that's what we're working on now to see which would be the best way to go forward. So, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson? Yeah, thank you. And the, the 350 kilometers. Uh, NT border to existing T line at Jocelyn Creek. Now, does that upgrade include upgrading the line from Pine Point to Hay River? Because I know that, that one of the reasons that I was told that we can't have electric heat is because that the, the system won't support it. So that 1.2 million doesn't apply to that section. Where is, is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, the 350 kilometers. And the 1.2 to 1.4 million per kilometer is just for the, the trunk line that would go uh, from the NWT border to, Saskatchewan, to uh, Jocelyn Creek in Alberta. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson? Oh, okay. I was looking at the, uh, I see there's a red line coming down from Hay River, so I was wondering if, uh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Um, I guess I was, uh, I'll just finish up, but uh, I, I was asking the minister questions about this about a year ago, and there doesn't seem to be any new numbers or any new information. So how many hours has the department put into this, this project? Because it seems like it's where it was last February. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Guy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have to get an actual number on the number of hours, but there, there's been quite a bit of uh, work done in advancing the project, updating the studies, working with the various consultants, as well as engagement with our uh, partners in southern Canada. So uh, I can assure committee that, that this is a priority for the department and we're putting uh, the resources on it. As the minister said, if there's more federal funding coming uh, in the budget to uh, develop business case and advance this project, then we'll have an opportunity to put more uh, more resources on it, and I think we would be able to move much quicker at that point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Simpson? Perhaps next time we can have an in-camera briefing to share a little more details, because this is this is information that uh, I got out of the minister from members' questions and question period a year ago. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to see a little more information coming to committee on these kind of projects. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize if you've already answered this question in previous meetings. But on page three, uh, you're just looking at that slide there. It has a canal. Is that actually going to be something that you're going to be building, or is there that canal existing presently? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That would be new construction. New construction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Sorry, I had to write down my notes there. Um, uh, We're efficient in this committee. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> on number seven, uh, on page, uh, on slide number seven, <clears throat> we talk about the rate and the funding coming, asking the feds $500 <clears throat> million. What is the NWT's commitment? Is it $495,000 come from the G GNWT, or is it... Uh, 50-50 or 60-40, 75-25. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Guy? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe the, the ask is around 50% of the total project costs and recognizing that uh, there is a revenue stream there to pay the investment that the, the GNWT would be making. So it would be a repayable loan, if you like. 
So there's a financing stream associated with this that's being developed through the business case, so we're really asking the federal government for 50% of the cost. The rest would be financed through debt and have self self-financing. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Uh, in regards to the, the debt plan and how you're going to finance it, it, are you able to share that with committee? I believe it would probably be in camera, but are you able to share that with committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We can commit to uh, doing that once we fi uh, finish up the business case. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, on, pay, on slide number eight, it talks about uh, interjurisdictional energy uh, infrastructure, and it talks about NWT in southern provinces. Is at some point in time this project looking to connect? I know you got it as far as Hay River right now, but any way to look at it going to Port Providence and maybe up to, you know, the North Slave? And uh, yellow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Guy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate that question because I perhaps didn't cover that as well as I could have in the presentation. But when we look at this project and we look at the opportunity to have that southern intertie, it's really a foundational piece, a transformational piece, if you like. Once we are connected to the south, then a long-term vision would be, you know, building on the work done in previous power system plans. Uh, um, to bring uh, power up through um, those types of connections that the members raise, you know, and perhaps even as far as into the Yellowknife and uh, the Slate Geological Province, for example, and it would really provide an opportunity to uh, support economic development and the availability of, uh, of green, uh, green power uh, or green electricity. Uh, so if you look at the long-term vision, this is really the, the foundational piece to start moving in that direction. You really need to have a, a robust inner tie with the national grid and, and developing this first 60 megawatts sets the stage for uh, stage development to the full 200, and then you can start looking at those opportunities to have further sales uh, throughout the territory through, through transmission line expansion. So. So this is a foundational piece, if you like, to that type of visionary. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Thompson. Uh, just my last one. That just just a clarification. Um, I heard the date March 20th. Is that when you guys are going to hear back uh, from the federal government this year, or, or March 20th this year? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's when we're hoping we're going to hear some kind of announcement around the federal budget. The federal budget's on March 22nd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, too, support this project here. And it goes back to the old saying here, no financing, no project. But I, I see lots of good margins, lots of good benefits, um, meeting federal targets on uh, green greenhouse gas emission reductions, uh, cross-border uh, partnerships to eliminate uh, coal consumption in southern parts. Uh, there's some Aboriginal involvement. And um, you've taken on some pre-investment to the project already. And we're just a weeks away from uh, the end of the month here where we're going to see uh, a federal announcement. So I, I, I really uh, cross my fingers and hope that this is another promising project that uh, I could see some contributions from on, on the federal part. So that's all i got to say is uh, keep up the good work and uh, let's cross our fingers and uh, just don't spend a lot of money on uncertainty. And... Um, Knowing, uh, knowing the um, knowing the extent on another potential customer here, um, the uh, tar sands in, in the McMurray area, I'm hearing has potential on on the Saskatchewan side. So that might be a, a northern Saskatchewan potential customer down the road that. Uh, you might want to consider engaging in the preliminary discussions there as well. So those are just my preliminary observations and statements here. And I, I look forward to the uh, announcement. Hopefully there's some positive results and 
and look forward to April's br briefing if we do get a commitment. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Take that as a comment. Anything regarding the comment, Mr. Schumann, or comment noted? Comment noted. Comment okay. Noted. Thank, you, Thank you. I'll go back to Mr. Bolio. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll take one more shot at this. I hear um, Saskatchewan government has engaged, uh, partners in the south engaged, Saskatchewan power engaged. Uh, so uh, my question goes back to um, uh, uh, could the minister tell me why? Uh, they are refusing to engage the Aboriginal governments at this point. So just to be clear, I want to say that that would be the NWT Métis Nation. Uh, uh, the Acacia Territorial Government consists of Fort, Fort Resolution, Dinan Point First Nations, uh, Fort Resolution Métis Council, uh, um, um, uh, Dini, uh, Dini Council. Uh, uh, Danny Ban, and um, and also I th I'm I'm assuming that the Fort Smith uh, Métis also um, uh, have feel that the, they they are also will, would be impacted. Their traditional areas would be impacted. I can't I can't, I, I, I can't figure out why um, when we're engaging. Uh, the Saskatchewan government, uh, Sask Saskatchewan power, and uh, and other partners in the south, uh, that we're not getting in early to try to gain some sort of support from the Aboriginal uh, governments when when those are the people that are impacted by the development. And so it's um, and and I'm amazed at the refusal of uh, of the minister to to absolutely say he's not going to engage the government until this has gone down the road a ways. I just don't understand that at all. I'd like the minister to t tell me why. Why there is a refusal to engage Aboriginal governments in this project. Okay. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I've said, uh, first of all, we came up with the idea for the project for the Pan-Canadian Framework. This is a project we move forward. The federal government has uh, 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 took some serious interest in this, as you see on slide eight, all the stuff that check marks are checked off what the federal government is looking for in these, in these projects. We've had to engage with Saskatchewan Power specifically so we have a customer for this project. Um, if you're going to build a project, you better have a customer to sell the power to. Um, we need the federal involvement to, uh, to be able to realize this project with their investment of $500 million, but at the same time, we've got to have a customer to sell it. Once we, those things all align and it comes together, we get federal and federal money, hopefully on March 22nd, moving forward, then we'll be able to engage the Aboriginal governments. Uh, I don't see any need to engage them until we come. We already know that we have the potential project that was there with DESI. We had been engaged with them prior to, prior to this on that project. All we're trying to do now is find a new customer replacing what the diamond mines were with federal involvement until $500 million to make this thing come together. And when that time comes, we will engage with the Aboriginal governments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Bolio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, all of those things can be done while you're engaging the Aboriginal governments. Like all of the things that the minister talks about, uh, uh, a partnership with the federal government, talking, uh, getting a customer lined up uh, to make sure that they have somewhere to sell the power. All those things can still happen. M my question is, if this has an impact, and it does have an impact on the people, the users of that land, why would the government refuse to engage them early in the process? Never mind what happened at Daze, that didn't work. Don't have, didn't have a customer. It was because the mines didn't have a life, uh, uh, the life uh, uh, of the mine was too short to, to, be, to make it feasible. At that point, I think it was $700 million. But this is a different matter. There's almost a guarantee that if, if the, everything gets approved that they will sell power. It's not like the Saskatchewan's going to shut down or, or, or Alberta. So these are almost guarantees, but, but to not engage Aboriginal governments deliberately, I mean, this is not even an oversight. This is a deliberate attempt not to engage Aboriginal governments that are impacted by the, by the Tulsan Dam. I'd like to know why the minister would deliberately not engage Aboriginal governments. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, obviously, myself and the member have a different point of view on how this is moving forward. I firmly believe that we need to quantify the project first and have a customer. And uh, with the, once we secure that, we will engage with Aboriginal governments moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Bolio? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a comment. I think that the approach is asking the Aboriginal government to oppose the project. I think this, this is approach. This, this is the right way if you want opposition. If you want opposition to this project, do it this way. Follow this script, and then you'll see that the Aboriginal people will, will, will say, well, this thing is moving along. GNWT is refusing to engage us until they, they're, they've guaranteed some things or secured some things or secured funding or secured a customer. That's a way to get opposition. So either you do it that way and create an unnecessarily create an opposition to the project or go see the Aboriginal governments and engage the Aboriginal governments and see where they stand now. I think they would be a lot more amenable to the project if they were, they were in at the outset, not brought in after, thing, after all the major decisions were made. That's a comment. Thank you. Comment noted to the comment. Nothing to the comment. Anything further from committee with regard, with regard to comments, questions, concerns? Seeing nothing further. Minister, any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just thank the committee for taking the time, especially after a long day today, for, uh, to hear our presentation, and I look forward to further updates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Well, we thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you again for your presentation, and we can be adjourned. Thank you.